Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. A man's got to have a good reason to renounce his native land forever. A reason to say, like death. Or worse, life under tyranny. For this reason, thousands of men and women and children who loved freedom more than fatherland have made their way across the frontier to the West in the past two months. Of the more than 20,000 who have arrived in the United States, only eight have been sent back. This might have been the story of one of these. Listen, then, to Freedom This Way, starring Mr. Hans Conry. <laughs> Look on the right side of the plane, the stewardess is saying. You will see the light of New York. And you do. But you cannot see them very clearly because your eyes are filled with tears. Look down there on the water. Yes, it is the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty. Oh, Mama, is that maybe heaven down there? Yes. Yes, my dear, maybe it is. We must admit why a regular theater boy, New Jersey, that. No, he's telling you you are landing at the McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, in America. Stay in your seat, she says, until your name is called. And that is all right. You can wait a little longer now that you are safe. You can sit and wait and listen to the men outside, welcoming you with the music that reminds you of home. Hello, Hodge. You don't hear the officer the first time. You lean back in that seat, wrapped in the warm mantle of security. Hello, Hodge. Ha- oh, oh, yes, sir. Are you Bella Hodge? Yes, sir. Come with me. Hello. Oh, but sir, I... You understand English, don't you? Yes, sir. I said, come with me. Hello. Sit down. Thank you very much, sir. Before you left Vienna, you filled out certain forms, did you not? Yes, sir. And signed them? Yes, sir. Is this one of the forms you filled out? Yes. And this is your signature? Bella Hodges? Yes, sir. But it's not your name. Is it? Is it? No. Your real name is Bartok, isn't it? Yes, sir. The gays are Bartok. Do you know that the penalty for giving false information to the United States immigration authorities... His immediate deportation is the country of your origin. No, sir. No, no, I can't go back. You should have thought of that when you falsified your entry papers. But I couldn't help it, sir. I had to. Why did you have to? Do you believe me if I tell you, sir? I'll try to. You people are welcome here, or we wouldn't have brought you here. But you've got to play the game according to the rules. I know. I know, sir. It was wrong of me, I suppose. But there was nothing else I could do. It, it was difficult to explain. How shall I put it? We we were free, you see. For five days, we were free. I was one of the ones who took over Radio Budapest on 23rd October. We renamed it Radio Free Budapest, and we broadcast truth instead of lies, but not for long. Two days after the Russians returned, while the Hungarian freedom fighters were selling each street corner with their lives, I made the last throw. As a bullet says, no more sad radio. The Red Army says, I am advancing graphically now. We haven't got enough guns or enough ammunition. But we will hold out to the last drop of blood. Goodbye, friends. 
studios took a direct shell hit, and that was the end of Radio Free Budapest. Those of us who were not killed were herded into Koporoshi House, headquarters and prison of the dreaded and hated ABH, the security police. When my eyes became accustomed to the gloom of the cell, I discovered that I was not alone. Another man was lying motionless on the bunk opposite mine. He was not sleeping. His eyes were open, but he did not seem to see me. He seemed to look straight through me. I smiled, but his face remained motionless. Oh, this thing. Hello. Hello, I'm, I'm talking to you. Don't you hear me? What's the matter with you? Answer me. Answer me. At first I thought he remained silent because he feared I was informer. And then, as the long night dragged by, a dirty gray light through the grilled window announced another day, I became convinced that it was he who worked for them. I was now convinced he was part of the psychological breakdown. He was the first modest step in a process that would end with my voluntary confession to a dozen crimes that I had never committed, implicating a hundred persons I scarcely knew. Sat there and stared through that long day and the next. And then sometime during the night, the guards came. Jerry Verm, follow me. Who? Me? Not you, the other one. We are not ready for you yet, but we will be. You. Vida, come. Oh, why don't you stop this comedy? You know this man is one of you, a secret police. We do not shoot our own. And him we are going to shoot. It is true, my friend. You, you can talk. Of course. And here, too. At first, I thought you were an informer. Me? No, I thought... That. Now I know. So I wish you better luck than I had. His eyes were dry. His chin was firm. And he shook my hand. And then he turned and walked through the door. After the barred door had clunked shut was doubly locked, and the footfalls had died away in the corridor, I unclenched my right fist. When he had shaken my hand, the condemned man had pressed into my palm a pitifully small steel file. I whirled around to the window. Yes, the center bars had been filed, almost through. It must have taken weeks of the utmost patience. A labor that my presence had interrupted. A project now evolving upon me. I failed to work with the will, but it was work. Tedious work. The fingers aching as they sought to grip the tiny file. The arms bone weary from the short, small strokes. But work that went ahead. All through the rest of that night and the next. Until all was in readiness. I plied the bars apart and started out the window and got stuck halfway through. I struggled and turned, tearing my clothes, tearing my flesh, and finally breaking loose from the iron vice, I lost my balance and tumbled into the yard below, full in the blinding circles of the prison set line. Drink this slowly. Okay. Thank you. As I drank the chalky fluid, my eyes slowly came into focus and my ears into tune. I was in a bed in a hospital ward. My heart leaped and, and sank, for the sun which streamed through the windows fell upon the floor in the pattern of bars. I turned to the young nurse standing over me, impersonal, impervious. 
My eyes must have expressed the question. She replied impassively. You did not get far. You are still in Koporoshi House. I was not lucky enough to be shot. You will be when you have recovered. Why? Why did they not... <laughs> quiet. You must be quiet. The doctor will be here in a minute. She nodded toward the door, and as I looked in that direction, the doctor entered. My heart stopped for an instant, and then raced. It was Turkey Damo. I knew him. He was one of us. Or had been back in 1944, in the days when the underground was pushing the Nazis out of Budapest. This is a new patient, doctor. Attempted escape. Oh, yes. I was told about this one. Doctor. Doctor. One of the freedom fighters, eh? Seems you have lost your freedom and there's no fight left in you. Hey, my little man? Doctor, doctor, aren't you fecity damned? Don't you remember me, Botokeza? Don't you remember how we held the, the Margaret ticket against the Nazis in 44 when we were both students? Obviously delirious nurse. Increases sedation. Fecity damned, <laughs> what are you doing here in Koproshi House? Have you forgotten the word of Pertefi Chandor? How our father shouted them in 1919. How we shouted them in 44. How those kids shouted them last week. Mud, your right. Your country calls you. Meat is our whatever we call you. Yes, obviously delirious. Better move him to a private room where he can't disturb the others. Yes, doctor. Now, the next case. It was not long before I learned why the renegade Dr. Fekete had moved me to a private room. Late that evening, when the hospital was most quiet, he paid me a visit. Well, how's the little freedom fighter tonight? I don't need your care nor your insults, Dr. Turncoat Fekete. I was quite a show you put out in the walk this afternoon, Geza Bartok, but scarcely the time nor the place. No, you did remember me then, huh? Keep your voice down. You didn't expect me to recognize you in that crowded ward, did you? No. No, of course not. It was foolish of me, but to find you, you working for them, I know. No, why, Dr. Fekete, why? Are you a married giver? No, a revolutionary cannot afford the luxury of family life. And a family man cannot afford the luxury of revolution. Oh, you excuse yourself with sentimental rubbish. You will think differently when you become a husband and a father. Which is as likely as my ever escaping from Koporoshi House. Others have. Oh, with my assistance. Oh, doctor, forgive me. I did not realize. There are more ways of serving than shouting patriotic verses at the top of your lungs. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, there are. Now, first of all, we must make you ill. Make me ill? Listen, I feel bad enough as it is. Yes, but your sprains and contusions aren't enough to keep you in the hospital more than a few days. And we may need more time than that. For what? How will you get me out? I haven't the slightest idea at the moment. In matters of this sort, we improvise as we go along. Dr. Fekete was true to his word. The following morning... The nurse Anna gave me an injection. And by that afternoon, I was sicker than I ever remembered. Time stopped. Days and nights ran together in nauseous delirium, marked only by the periodic hypodermic injection. At last came the day when the injection did not throw me into wretched convulsions. Instead, my head seemed to be clearer. I was dimly aware of being wheeled along the corridor by Nurse Anna. And then I found myself in a small operating room. Dr. Fekete was there, and the nurse, and a still form on the operating table. A form with a sheet drawn over its head. And vaguely, I heard Dr. Fekete say, Make out the death certificate this way, nurse. Name? Bartok Geza, cause of death, internal injuries sustained while attempting escape. Doctor, doctor. Yes, Geza? Uh, Just like quietly, since you are now quite dead. You can fill in the rest of it down at the morgue. There is no more room in the morgue, doctor. They are stacking the bodies in the courtyard now. Good. In that case, they may even mislead the corpse of Geza Bartok. But if that's Geza Bartok lying there and he's dead, 
Who am I? You are now Bela Hyatt. And you have a great deal to learn while you're convalescing from your emergency appendectomy. It seemed too good to be true. There, there, there must be a flaw somewhere. I worried about it. I wondered about it as the nurse wheeled me back to a new room, to Bela Hyosh room. When the doctor came by that night, my head was buzzing with a dozen unanswered questions. But, doctor, if I couldn't hope to get out of Koprosh house, how can you be so sure that Bela Hayosh will be released? Bela Hayosh was picked up along with a hundred other suspects two days before the rebellion began. Security police could prove nothing against him. Then why wasn't he free when we took over the city? He was in the prison hospital with acute appendicitis. Too sick to be moved. He was still there when the Russians returned. Certain proof that he had nothing to do with the rebellion. He will be released as soon as his, uh, your appendectomy is healed. You are sure? I guarantee it. Now take this and learn it tonight. What is it? The facts about Bela Hayos. The answers to the questions you will be asked before they release you. You must be able to answer everything on this page instantly. A single slip will mean death for you. And for me, too. Why, why are you doing this, Doctor? <laughs> Call it patriotism or a guilty conscience? In any case, it's the least I can do for men like you. I spent the rest of the night reading and rereading about the man I had become, concentrating fiercely to absorb... Every tiny detail. Then, a few moments before the nurse arrived on her morning round, I followed the doctor's orders, tore the piece of paper into a hundred pieces, and swallowed them. And that night, Dr. Fekety began rehearsing me. Name? Hayosh Pela. Date of birth? 7 July 1920. Place of birth? Modirova. Military service? Under Lieutenant 14 Hussars, wounded twice, the war was Over and over again, hour after hour, night after night. Mother's name? Zita Radna. Father's name? Janos. Very good. Very good, Zilayos. I would say you're ready to be released from the hospital at last. But what about my identity paper? Your personal effects were taken from you when you were arrested. Your passport will be returned to you when you are released. Passport? It will have Hayosh picture in it. And so it has. Your picture. But how, how do you think we are not thorough? At least as thorough as the security police? Yes, but how could you make? Geza Bartok was photographed when he was arrested, was he not? Yes. The photograph of Geza Bartok is now affixed to Bela Hayos passport. I don't see how you could manage. To survive? A slave sometimes has to excel the master at his own game. Be prepared to leave the hospital in the morning. When I appeared next morning before the interrogating officer, all hope left me. He was not of the Hungarian security police. He was a Russian, a captain in the Soviet intelligence service. Apparently, the Russians were taking no chances on another slip-up in this satellite. On the desk before him was spread the dossier of Bela Hayos. And the play for which Dr. Fekety had so well rehearsed me began. Name? Hayos Bela. Born when? 7 July 1920. Where? Modirova. Mother's name? Zita Radna. Mother's name? Milan. On and on, question after question and answer after right answer. Finally, the captain seemed satisfied and tore open a brown manila envelope, dumping its contents on the desk before me. A few coins, a wallet... Wait. Uh, what is this? A passport? Yes, sir. Where are your other papers? Identity card, ration card? They came for me in the middle of the night. I did not have time. No time? No time to find anything but a passport? Because a passport is what you need to get over the border. 
Why did you want to leave the country? I didn't want to leave the you country. You need a passport to cross the Danube from Budapest? No, but the passport has always been sufficient. You wanted to leave the country? Why? 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 But I didn't. You lie. All Hungarians are liars. I fought back the compulsion to spit into the face of this swinish lad. And then he pushed the passport in the wallet toward me, indicating that having insulted me, the interview was over. As I picked up the wallet, something fell out of it and fluttered to the desk. A picture of a woman. A woman who was a complete stranger to me. Before I could retrieve it, the captain snatched it up. Whose picture is it? Uh, uh, my wife. You do not seem sure. <laughs> of course I'm sure it. It's my wife. Name? Margaret. Age? 25. You love her? Yeah. She loves you? Of course. Then why is she not here to take you home? Uh, she didn't know I was being released today. Why didn't you inform her? Do you think anyone from here would have taken her the message? Her? Yes, I would have. Hmm. Not bad. Not bad at all. Undoubtedly one of the heroic women of Budapest. Those great patriots who brave our tanks with bared breath to lay wreaths upon their hero's grave. Why isn't she here to meet you? I, uh, I wanted to surprise her. It is a scene I must witness. The surprise of your hero wife. Uh, you do not mind if I accompany you home? No. No, uh, of course not. <laughs> I knew the game was up, but I was determined to play it through to the last move. I sat beside this distrustful sadist in the back of the Z start car, and as we picked our way through the rubble of Budapest, I thought time had turned back 12 years to the war. Lime-covered bodies still lay decomposing in the streets. Smashed and burned tanks blocked the intersection. In a hole blown from the third floor of an apartment house, a bathtub teetered ridiculously. There was no traffic. Budapest seemed uninhabited. For that day, all Hungary had gone on a general strike of protest. At last, our silent journey ended at 19 Molnarshild, my home. I mean, Bela Hoyos' home. What are you waiting for? I'm afraid. Of what? My wife, when she sees you in that uniform, I'm afraid she will be frightened. A Hungarian woman frightened? I thought nothing frightened a Hungarian woman. Get out. Please, let me go in alone. Yes, just for time to explain. Yes, for explaining. I will explain. It's I, Bela. Bela? Ma, Edison, darling. Oh. I'm back home, back home. You didn't expect me, I know. Oh, darling, darling, it's so good to hold you in my arms again. Oh, I'm so happy, happy. She does not seem so happy to see you. I told you she'd be frightened by your presence, but she is happy, aren't you, darling? Of, of course I am, I am happy. I, it is just I am at a loss for words. There, you see, Captain? Would not any wife be happy when her husband returns, even if he does forget to kiss her? Oh, my love, forgive me. Mama, Mama, can I go out and play? Mama is busy here. Oh, a rusty. What? Now run along or he will take you away with him. This is your child? Yes. I asked him. Yes, it is her child. I suppose she has a name? Certainly. Her I name. asked him. What is her name? Wait, uh, it's, uh, uh... It's Percy, that's what it is, Percy. Shut up! But that is my name. Of course it is, darling. And now if you will excuse us, Captain, my husband and I have a lot to talk about, privately. And thank you so much for driving him home. It's your... Uh, I, I owe you an explanation. No, no, you do not. And I owe Cotty my, my thanks for not giving me away. But his father taught her not to ask questions in front of strangers. 
Then did my husband die? A week ago. I knew he wouldn't be back. This time I knew he wouldn't be back. You must be hungry. May I get you something to eat? No, please don't bother. It is never a bother to feed a hungry man. With her husband dead, there was nothing to keep Margaret in Budapest any longer. And certainly it was no safe place for me. And so Bela Hayosh, his wife and daughter, made the long, difficult journey across the frontier to Vienna. Well, that's quite a story, Mr. Hajos. There's one point that beats me. What is that, please, sir? Once you were safely in Vienna, why did you go on impersonating Bela Hajos? Why didn't you tell the authorities the truth? Because of Katsi, mostly. During that long trip across the border, hiding in the forest, wading through swamps, walking in the cold rain, she clung to me and called me Papa. Until it almost seemed as though I really were her Papa. Yes, until it seemed I was really Margaret's husband. I was all they had, you see. They, they needed me. Uh-huh. And so you entered the United States as man and wife. That's right, sir. But you're not married. There was no time. Hmm. That's another section of the immigration law you've broken, Mr. Hodgos. Comes under the heading of moral turpitude. There he is, Mama. Huh? He is Papa talking to the man. Do not disturb him, Marcotti. You can see he's busy. Who is the man, Mama? I thought you said Carty had been trained not to ask questions in front of strangers. Oh, I, I told her it would not be necessary in America. I told her in America it was safe to talk to anyone. What's your name? Well, you call me Uncle Sam. Uh, are you a good uncle? <laughs> I try to be. Oh, uh, one last question, Mr. Hajo. Yes, sir? How much money do you have with you? Oh, I'm afraid not very much. A few penger and some offering shillings. No American money? Oh, no, sir, but I hope to find a job quick. I'm sure it? you will. In the meantime, here's two dollars. But why? Take them. You'll need them. What for? The marriage license. Juan Conrad starred in Freedom This Way. Produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And written by Erno Verabesh, Max Colpe, and Mr. Robeson. Heard in the cast were Margie List, Melissa Milo, Norma Jean Nilsson, Charles Ravillac, Joe DeSantis, Jack Crucian, and Fritz Fells.